Hello, my dear students, and welcome to our final chapter with our optical system. It was a long journey, nearly a 10 weeks course. Now we reach the final station in this course, which is the Gaussian B. So now please permit me to start sharing my presentation slides to start together the final lecture dealing with Gaussian B. Okay, so now the time to terminate the course through the Gaussian beam lecture. In this Gaussian beam, we are now intended to focus on how light, especially laser, is propagating in any medium. We have studied together the theory of laser in the forms of an optical cavity as well as in the form of a light amplification or light oscillation in the three chapters, three, four, and five. Now, how this light propagates, how this light behaves as an electromagnetic wave inside a medium. So in order to solve this question, we have to return to the nature of a light as an electromagnetic wave. This is addressed in our reference, laser electronics, in chapter three and chapter five under laser oscillation and application. Okay, so now we have to go back to the theory of the electromagnetic wave because light is simply an electromagnetic wave. So we have to deal with it as an electromagnetic wave. From the electromagnetic wave theory and especially from Maxwell's equation, we know that the D, which is a diversion, uh, which is, uh, sorry, the electrical field density is equal to zero whenever there is no charge uh, in the space, which is rho V, if you remember. And similarly, we know that the V is equal to zero, and this is due to the continuity of the magnetic field line. So using the, the knowledge that D equals epsilon times E and B uh, and uh, B equals mu times H. And assuming an unisotropic medium, I mean that, sorry, isotropic medium, I mean that epsilon and H are not uh, uh, dimension independent. So you can say that the E is equal to zero. And also you can say that the H is equal to zero. Okay, so let's pick up one of them and let's say, for example, that E equal to zero and this is our starting uh, equation in this matter. So if you remember from your microwave and maybe you from your antenna classes that we usually distinguish the uh, electrical field component into two types of components. What we call the transverse component and what we call the longitudinal components. So transverse and longitudinal components are the components of the direction of the propagation. So usually maybe in your microwave and in your antenna classes, you consider that the direction of a propagation is that. That's why you consider the Z as the direction of the longitudinal. As far as Z is the direction for the longitudinal component, so basically X and Y will be the direction for uh, the transverse component. Accordingly, you can break down this question saying that diversions of the E transverse plus diversions of EZ equals to zero. Because it simply E is equal to EX, EY, and EZ. EX and EY are combined together in the transverse component, and EZ is a longitudinal component which represents the direction of propagation. Okay, perfect. So let's keep this equation in mind because we will return to, to it later. Okay. 
Now, let's see what is exact. Again, let's use your microwave classes and say that Z equals to E node multiplied by E power minus J KZ. I believe that you are totally familiar with this equation. When we said that the direction of the propagation is dependent on the electrical field in the terms of the propagation constant K, where K equals to 2 pi over lambda, or generally it equals to 2 pi n over lambda node, where n is the refractive index of the medium, and lambda node is the wavelength at free space. So you can write this equation that Ez is equals to E node times E power minus j, 2 pi n over lambda node z. Now, following this general equation, we need to make the divergence of this component with respect to z. So, this z with respect to z will result with minus j 2 pi n over lambda node times the same term, which is e. So divergence is that equals to minus j 2 pi n lambda node over e. Just to get right out of this uh, imaginary term, so let's take the absolute. So it will be equals to 2 pi n over lambda node is that. Okay, that's perfect. So this is another equation, please keep it in your mind. Okay, what about the transverse component? Following to the first equation, which is this one, we need to find also, we now have this term, which is the divergence of the EZ, and now we, we need to get the divergence of this transverse component. But we know nothing about the transverse component. We don't know any expression about the transverse component. Herein, Verdin suggests a mathematical approximation. What is the mathematical approximation suggested by Bird? Okay, so what is the suggested solution by Bird? So let's do this experiment. I now, I'm now holding a laser pointer. I will start to direct this laser pointer to the paper. I don't know if you can recognize the spot slide. Okay, so let's assume that this vertical direction from the paper to the camera is a z-axis. Accordingly, the direction of the propagation is z. And this is a longitudinal direction. And here, this is a transverse component, the x and y, where you can recognize the spot size. This is a spot of laser, of red laser. It should be red, I don't know, too which color you can see with it, but it should be red. So this is a spot size. This spot size will look like, or it looks like some circle like that. Of course, not that big, but it should be some circle. So I'm just using another band. So it should be some circle like that. And let's say that the diameter of this circle is D. Again, this is the area of the detection, the area of the transverse component. Again, let's do, let's do the experiment. So again, this is a spot size. Of course, I plot one which is larger in dimension just to, to be easy to be recognized by you, but the concept that it's a circle. So 
with a diameter uh, d. So knowing that this diameter is relatively lower with respect to the electrical field component variation, you can say that the divergence of the longitudinal component is approximately equal to the same longitudinal component over the diameter. This is a mathematical approximation, which is valid. You can track Verdine in order to verify it mathematically step by step, or you can trust me and use it as a So following this equation, following this equation, we can return back to our general equation, saying that divergence of E transverse plus divergence of EZ is equal to zero. Okay, so following this equation, we, what we can do simply is that we are going to substitute. So divergence of the transverse term is just E transverse over D plus the divergence for the first, uh, for the longitudinal component, this one, we have already reached this expression, if you remember, which is minus j to pi n of lambda mod Ez. This is minus j to pi n over lambda node times Ez. This should be equal to zero. So we can say that j to pi n over lambda node times E z equals to E transverse over D. Let's have the magnitude of both sides. So this J will be canceled. And then let's make E z in one, in one uh, side and the other in one side. So E z equals to lambda node over two pi n D times E transverse. And let's examine this equation. This equation tells us the Z component or the longitudinal component of the electrical field in terms of the transverse component. Okay, no problem. You get a component for the transverse, or sorry, for that longitudinal in terms of the transverse. No worries. This is something good. But what is the observation? out of this conclusion or out of this uh, uh, equation. That's it. We have this coefficient, which is lambda node two pi and D is the coefficient of proportionality between E Z and E, and e transverse. Let's examine the value of this, of this graph. Lambda node is a propagation wavelength as free space. Here we are talking about light. So this lambda node may be 500 nanometer, 550 nanometer, 600 nanometer, 800 nanometer in the infrared, something like that. So it's something in the nanometer range. Two pi is a constant, n is a refractive index, which is something maybe two, three, four, twelve, thirteen, 13, something like that. And D is the diameter of the spot size, if you remember this. This diameter is, uh, logically speaking, this diameter is somehow a big value. Maybe this is something in the millimeter range, for example, or sometimes it could be if it's a, a normal light source like this one, I'm not sure if it's here or not. This is a light source, but its intensity is very low. So it may be in centimeters sometimes, but normally for, uh, for lasers, it, be, it is something in millimeter. That's why we can recognize it by eye, by the way because if it's in the micrometer or it's in the nanometer range, you will not be able to recognize it by your neck eye. So this D maybe is in the millimeter range. So you are now, now dividing two terms. The denominator term is in the nanometer range, while the denominator term is in the millimeter range. I mean that the denominator is much smaller than, than that, then the denominator 
so the denominator is much smaller than the denominator by 10 power 6 times. The resultant of this fraction is something in the order of 10 power negative 6. That simply means that EZ is very, very, very small because you will get the E transverse and you will multiply it by 10 power negative 6. So you can say that EZ is approximately equal to 0. Okay, then if you return to the first equation, we have concluded that we have this equation, this equation. So what we will for this electrical field, we can do the same for the magnetic field. And you can reach the same conclusion that HZ is approximately equal to zero. Now, return back to your microwave console. When EZ and HZ are zeros, this is what we call the TEM mode, or the transverse electromagnetic mode. However, honestly, EZ and HZ are not typically zero. They are very, very, very small values. That's why in light propagation, we call this a quasi TEM mode. It's not typically a TEM mode, it's a quasi one. It's something which can be assumed to be a TEM mode. And this is the reason why we consider it as a TEM mode. If you go to Verdine, and if you follow the same procedures you did in your microwave console, you can easily find an equation for the electrical field of the magnetic field due to light. I will not do it step by step. It's not required from you to do this derivation due to the limited length, uh, time. So I will skip this derivation. However, we will go together now and see what will be the output of this derivation. Again, it's typically the same like what you did in microwave to solve for a certain system to find the E and H. The same procedure. And by the way, you can find hints about this in our lecture script. And of course, the complete revision is, is accessed through version. So now let's go to the presentation slides again. And let's see. This is what we did together. And this is the output, if you remember. And we have a nearly TEM mode in our case, which was the case for light volume. Then, solving Maxwell's equation in order to get the electrical field, we will get this very large electrical field. By the way, you are not requested to memorize it in the exam. It will be given for you this expression. But we have to understand this expression. And in order to understand this expression, we have to somehow start to divide it into portions so that we can understand each portion individually. So in this case, for example, let's start to think how we can divide this term. If you start to see, you will find that this first portion Mm, yes, this, this first portion is a very fundamental portion. As you can see from this portion, we have a term which is 100% a magnitude term, E node, omega node over omega z, where omega z equals to uh, the root of omega node square plus one plus z over z node, so all of these are magnitude. E power minus R square over omega square of z. You can easily recognize that this exponential term is considered a decaying exponential term. So it is some sort of attenuation because you have this negative to this uh, negative sign with the exponential. But you can easily tell me we, we still have two other exponential. Why you did not include the other two exponential in this portion? This is simply because. The other two exponential include this J imaginary coefficient, which means that these two exponentials are a phase exponential. However, this exponential is an attenuation or an amplitude exponential. That's why the first portion in this square is just limited to 
those factors affecting the amplitude of the electrical field, as you can see. Then we, it seems that we have a two phase of terms. The first phase of term is a function in Z, where Z is the direction of the propagation, while the second phase of term is function in R, where R represents the radius of the system or the radius of the propagation. That's why we can uh, divide this electrical field equation into three portions. What we call, I'm sorry, what we call the amplitude portion, which is the, um, the portion in red affecting the amplitude of the electrical field. What we call the longitudinal phase portion in the blue, which is, which is varying with the variation of Z distance, with the variation of the direction of, pro of propagation, which is that. And what we call the radial uh, phase, or, uh, phase, which is this green term function in R, where R is the radial direction. So these are the three terms. By the way, you can ask me, you told us that this is the transverse component, which is X and Y, but what is R? Please don't forget the cylindrical coordinates. The X, Y can be represented as, as an R phi in the cylindrical coordinate. And whenever you have a beam of light, it makes sense to use cylindrical coordinates rather than to use a Cartesian coordinate. That's why we use here cylindrical coordinates. But by the way, and using the knowledge of you got about the, the coordination system, of course, you can still use the X, Y uh, Cartesian system in order to design or in order to express this equation. However, it will be some, somehow more difficult to use X, Y rather than to use the cylindrical coordinates. Okay, that's not. So in this, in the, in the first page, we will make focus on this portion related to the direction of the propagation, oh, sorry, the uh, amplitude portion of the electrical. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to copy paste this equation in my whiteboard and we will start together discussing how this equation is varying. So let's do it. All right, so this is the equation E equals E naught, omega naught over, over omega Z, E power minus R square over omega square of Z where omega square of z equals to omega naught square times one plus z over z node all square and this the close bracket. So this is the equation. This is the equation we are going to consider. If you recognize this equation well, you will find that this equation is a function of r and z. So in order to start discussing this equation, we have to make life somehow easier. So let's first start to think about the variation with respect to R at a certain Z. So for example, let me start with Z equals zero. Z is equal zero is mean that the starting point of the, of the line, because this is the, 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 the position where the source is located. So if Z equals zero, that means that omega square will be equals to omega naught square because simply this term will be equals to zero. Then this bracket will tend to one and this omega square equals to omega naught square. Accordingly, E equal E naught. And then we have this coefficient equal to one, E power minus R square over omega naught square. So, if you would like to plot this curve as an E function with R, then you will find that this is typically a negative exponential term. When E, sorry, when E is equals to, sorry, when R is equals to zero, E power zero is equals to one, and then this term will equal to E naught. Then 
it will have a decaying something like that. Okay. And if you take care, whenever R will equals to omega, the value at which R is equals to omega, the intensity will be E node E power minus one. So when these values are omega node and negative omega node, then this value will be E node times E power minus one. This we will call it later on the beam width, but let's see. Okay, so this is a pretty good Then, what happened if, what happened if we re repeat the same story at another z? So let's take now z equal z mu. I mean, now let's propagate a distance equals to z node. This is typically as a, as a, as a source. Now let's propagate distance equals to z node. Then by substituting here, z over z node over z node is equal to one, one plus one square top equal one, one plus one equals to two. Then we have uh, omega square equal to two omega naught square, which means that omega equal to root two omega naught. So by substituting, then we have E equal E naught times. Now, omega Z equals to root two omega naught. So this would be E naught over root two. This would be E naught over root two. E power minus R squared over root two omega naught. So let me use another paper as well. So just to, to keep the comparison, I will start by copy and paste the first one, which is z equals to zero, then omega equals to omega naught, then we have uh, e equals to e node, e power minus r square over omega naught square, and whenever we plot it, it shows something like that. This value is e node, and this value, whenever r equal omega node, we have e node power e power minus one. This is the first case. Now, let's do the, ne the next case. So now z equal z node, accordingly, you will find that omega equals to root two omega node, Accordingly, E equals E node over root two, E power minus R square over root two omega naught. Or not root two, two, it will be a square, so it will be two omega naught square. Okay, so let's now start to plot this curve. Then the first observation is, when r is equal to zero, your magnitude will be E node over root two. Okay. And in order to reach the same decay, which is the magnitude multiplied by E power minus one, you have to reach a distance, which is root two omega naught. So, at this distance, the electrical field E node over root two will be multiplied by E power minus one. Okay, then where is the observation? Let's now start to plot these two graphs against each other. So this is R and this is E. The first graphs look like this. And the second graph still covers. What's happened? First, this at z equals zero, and this at z equals z naught. 
At that equals zero, the magnitude, the maximum magnitude, the peak magnitude was equals to E naught. But after a propagation to a distance equals to that node, this propagation becomes E node over root two, which is in terms of intensity, half the intensity because the intensity is square the electrical field. So whenever the electrical field is over root two, the intensity is, is over half. The second thing, the broadening of the curve, which is measured when the electrical field is decaying by the factor e power minus one, here this occurs at a distance omega naught. However, the same broadening here occurs at a distance root two omega. So whenever light, light starts to propagate, then two factors happen. The intensity of the light decreases by going farther in the direction of the propagation and the spot size become wider, which is a typical example. You can easily do it. Whenever you have a torch, a light source, and you have a wool, when you first start to be very close to the wall, then you will see a very high intensity spot size with a very small diameter. Once you go far, the spot size starts to increase and the intensity starts to decrease. This is typically what we express here, but we, but by why, what we call the Gaussian beams for our tools. So light sources, propagates in this manner. The higher the direction of the propagation, the higher the broadening of the curve and the lower or the spot size and the lower the intensity. We have here a very two recognizable distances. What we call Z node, which is the distance at which you lose 50% of your intensity. And what we call omega node, which is the spot size, the curve or the, the, the diameter indicating the, the, the value at which you lose e power minus one of your intensity or one over e of your intensity. So these two parameters are usually one of the or two of the main important parameters expressing any light source. So the coherency of the light source can be determined here because laser sources have a very unique properties in terms of omega node and Z node. So Z node in the lasers is very large. That's why let me go back to my laser pointer. It's a weak laser pointer, but by the way, I'm sorry. So that's why whenever you start here to make it far or near, you will not recognize a variation in the spot size by your eye because Z node is very large. So in order to reduce the intensity to half and in order to broad the curve, you have to go a very far distance. But whenever you go to any other typical light source like an LED source or this very bad source I have, this is, yes, maybe the battery is not so good. So this is a very, distort the source. This is the there is a totally uncoherent light source. So you can examine the coherency of the light source by evaluating these two parameters, which are the Z node and the omega. So this is a very good example where we can demonstrate the Gaussian behavior of a light source. Back to the presentation slide. So this is expressed here by this very nice, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, by this very nice graph. So this is the typical curve I just measured with a magnitude E node. He, he, he just normalized this E node to be one. And this omega node is the broadening of the curve to, to have an intensity E power minus one of the next. And then by going with respect to that, you will find that you have a lower intensity and a higher broadening, a higher spot size. So this is typically what uh, the effect of light. The other component, we have asked also two other components. We have the uh, longitudinal phase, which is, I will not consider it uh, in 
a very detailed manner. This is simply because it's a very mathematically difficult one. It's a tan minus one for an exponential. So somehow it's an advanced term for you. And what we call this radial phase, which is this phase. What is interesting in this radial phase, my dear students, is that the wave is propagating in a radial format. It has what's called a radial front phase. What is a radial front phase? Let's, let me try to express it. Okay, so a radial front phase is a phase at which light is propagating. A right is propagating with a radial phase. So, uh, I will try to make it in a very easy manner in order to make you understand it well, because this is somehow mathematically a bit difficult to be understood. If I told you that there is some vector component that has a variation in phase function in the x direction, for example. So you, would, you should expect the fall. Should expect that whenever you are moving in this axis, the phase will change. However, whenever you are moving this axis, the phase will not change because this have a constant x value. So all the points in this vertical axis has the same phase, but Whenever you change the phase, whenever you go along, along the x axis, the phase you change because this phase is function in x. Okay, so how we should express a phase function in the right or in the r direction? This is simply like that. Let's turn the x and y to be r and phi. What is the direction of r? This is the direction of r. So the phase change in this manner. All the points on each circular surface have the same phase because they have the same radius. However, the phase change by going in this direction. Okay. So if I have a cross-sectional area to express the ZR phase, so this is R, for example, and, or uh, yeah, let's make this is Z and this is R. So whenever the wave propagates, each propagation phase of the wave will have its radial phase. I mean, the phase takes this radial shape. Okay, so what are the problems of having such a radial phase? Let's see. So let's go here. And this is the radial phase of the wave, which is varying from one point to another because as we have, <clears throat> I'm sorry, as we have concluded, that the spot size increase with the direction of the propagation. So by each direction, by each incremental increase in the direction of propagation, you will have a new circle, a larger spot size with a large, with a larger radius, and then a new phase. But where is the problem of that? Actually, let's turn back two chapters to what's called the optical effect. Okay. Um, okay. Let's go. Okay. So in the optical wave guide, we have said that we have two mirrors. Light propagate from mirror one to mirror two. Then light hit this mirror number two, for example. Some of these slides reflect back, and as will be transmitting on some. Okay. Now we have discussed this now in details how light is propagating this propagation direction. And we mentioned that if the direction of the propagation, which is this one, is that, 
light is propagating in what's called a radial format or a radial phase. It's called a radial phase from. So now what will happen? Let me, let me zoom in this area. We have a vertical mirror lamp and we have a radial front light that works. That means that the point in the center of the circle will hit the mirror first and reflect. And then this point will hit at a later time and reflect. And this is a point, these points will hit on a later time and reflect and so on. Not all photons will hit the same mirror at the same time because due to this radial shape of the phase from it. So, in order to solve such a challenge, what we should do simply is as follows. To have a spherical matter. So, if we have a spherical matter, which, have, which has a curvature radius, typically equals to the base front of the, of the, of the light, then light will reflect totally in the same time. And this is the reason why we should have a spherical mirrors in an optical camera. So now this radius is typically the same like the radius of the wave propagating. So this is simply the, 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 the key or the, the trick in the play. The radius of the wave propagating is this radius, which is so yeah, Z equals one plus, uh, sorry, R equals Z times one plus Z node over Z whole square. Again, it makes sense that the radius depends on Z because whenever you go with uh, the direction of the propagation, your spot size diameter increase, which is means that your spot size radius increase. That's why it makes sense that R is directly proportional to Z. Okay, now the question is, how we should calculate R1 and R2. What is R1 and R2? R1 and R2 are the radius, it's a curvature radius for the mirror number one and the curvature radius for the mirror number two. How we shall calculate this R1 and R2? By the way, one of the main disadvantages of the Verdine is the conflict in the terminology. Because in chapter four, we have dealt with R1 and R2 as the reflectance of mirror one and mirror two, where they are the square of the reflection coefficient gamma. But now in this chapter, we are dealing with R1 and R2 as the, the radius of, of curvature. So you have just to take care about the expression and to think about it twice before using, or before saying that this is the radius or this is the reflection. But now our target is, to calculate R1 and R2 for the radius of reflection, or the, sorry, the radius of curvature for R1 for the first mirror and for the second mirror. Okay, so let me terminate this part by this two equations, which are expressing the radius for the uh, radius of curvature for the first mirror and the second mirror. And in the next part, which should be a short part, we are going to demonstrate how we can calculate R1 and R2 for different conditions. And this should be the termination of our module. So thank you very much for your concentration and see you in part number two of chapter number six.